And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length. A cubit and a half its width. A cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and out. You shall overlay it and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be towards the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we are in your awesome presence this morning. We thank you for the presence of the King of Kings amongst his people. And we're asking you this morning, Lord, that you will speak to us. We thank you that, Lord, we have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to us this morning. We pray that, Lord, as we listen to your word, that the engrafted word of God shall come into our souls, into our spirits. It will be a quickening force in every one of us, making us alive to the plans and purposes of God that we just sang about in our generation. We pray your will to be done in this gathering this morning of your people. We thank you, Lord, for the potential in this room this morning. We thank you for every man and woman who is called by your name. We thank you for the hand of God upon every life. And this morning we are praying that, Lord, your truth will bring liberty and gladness into our hearts. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, this is the last message this morning on the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness, God's church in the Old Testament. And uh, this morning we are coming right into the Holy of Holies. Remember there were three parts to the tabernacle. There was the outer court. There was the, in the outer court there were two things. There was the uh, bronze or the brazen laver where sacrifice was made just through the entrance of the gate. Then, before you went into the tent, there was the altar, um, the laver, the bronze laver for washing. Then we would go into the tent, and in the tent there were three pieces of furniture. We've looked at these over the weeks. There was, on the left-hand side, there was the lampstand. On the right-hand side... What was there? The table of showbread. And right in front of the veil was the altar of incense. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about the altar of incense. A place of prayer right in front of the veil. This morning, we are going to go behind that veil into the most holy of holies. The most sacred and holiest spot on the planet. Because it was here at this place that God Almighty dwelt. And we're going to look this morning at the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is a symbol of the 
divine presence of God amongst his people. He said that he would meet with them. And he said, I will commune, commune with you from above the mercy seat, from between the cherub, cherubims which are upon the ark of testimony. This, where the cherubims are there, the top slab where they're sitting on was called the mercy seat. The cherubims are there guarding that place because, as we'll see this morning, cherubims guarded the throne of God. And they're there this morning guarding the, the mercy seat. When we have looked at the ark, we have come in from the outside. We have come in from the, the wilderness. We've come through that white linen curtain that's stretched all around. And we've come in through the one gate. And we've made our way from the, 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 um, the, the brazen altar. We've made our way to the laver, then into the table of showbread, the lampstand, and the altar of incense. But I want you to notice, friends, although we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant this morning, last in this series of messages, it wasn't so. Because when God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle, the first thing he commanded Moses to build was this ark. This was the first. We've looked at it vice versa. We've come in from the outside. But as far as God was concerned, everything started from here. This was the first piece of furniture that was to be built in the tabernacle. The ark went first when they journeyed. It was the ark that led the children of Israel in their journeys through the wilderness. It was the ark, if you can remember, on the shoulders of the priests that stepped into the Jordan prior to them entering the promised land. The ark went first and the children of Israel crossed over, the Bible says, the Jordan. But it was the ark that went first, carried on the shoulders of the four priests. When they went into battle... It was the ark that led them into battle. The only time they presumed to go into battle, you can read about it in Numbers 14, without the ark, they were heavily defeated. The ark always led them in, into battle. When they marched around Jericho seven times, once, how many times did they march, march around? Can anybody tell me? Seven times on the last day. How many times? Seven times, I think, on the last day. It, it, it was the ark that led them in that march around Jericho. Why should the ark have the preeminence and the prominence? Simply, friends, because God wants to remind us that this ark represents the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he must have first place in everything. He's got to come first in everything. You see, when we give our lives to Christ, Jesus becomes present in our lives. He comes to live by faith in our hearts. He said, I'll come and make my home with you. Isn't it amazing that God has made his dwelling place with us? That God in the person of his son, Jesus, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in our hearts. I'll come and make my abode with them. God has chosen us to make his dwelling place uh, amongst. In some Christians, Jesus is prominent. In other words, he's very important. I guess to every Christian here this morning, Jesus is important. But I want to say, friends, Jesus wants to be more than important. He wants to be preeminent. The Bible says in all things he must have the preeminence. He's got to come first in my life and in yours. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and everything else will be added to you. Put God first in your life. That's why the ark was built first. This symbolized the presence of God amongst his people. And God wanted to be first. Friends, he wants to be first in our lives. If you can remember the word joy, it's an easy word, J-O-Y. It simply means Jesus first, others second, and yourself third, last. That's the biblical order. Let a man deny himself. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He must have preeminence in all things. The Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony contained three things. First of all, if we were to remove that lid that was called the mercy seat, we would find that in this box... There were three things. First of all, there were the Ten Commandments. The tablets of stone that Moses had received from God. Not, not the first ones, because remember when he came down from the mount, he smashed the first ones. And God told him to take the tablets up, and there he wrote on them the commandments the laws that would govern the life of Israel. Inside this chest, there were the laws that governed Israel that were received from God. Also inside the chest, there was a pot of manna. Remember, it was manna that the children of Israel ate. It was called angel's food. It came from, from heaven. In other words, God was providing spiritual food for his, his children. The Bible says they ate angels' food. It was white, symbolizing purity. It came at night time. It all speaks of Jesus, doesn't it? He was the bread of life. He came as the bread of life into this world. He came pure and holy and harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He came at the darkest hour in the world's history. God so loved the world. He gave his only son. And there was in this ark, this chest, the pot of manna, miraculously kept. Because remember, they didn't have to keep it overnight. It had to be eaten on the Sabbath day. They had to gather twice as much so that they didn't have to gather it on the Sabbath day. And on the Sabbath day, there were some people who went out to gather the manna, found out that it just... There was no manna there for them to... So they had to get twice as much the day before the Sabbath. But this manna in this chest was miraculously kept by God. Also in the chest, there was Aaron's rod. Moses' brother Aaron's rod. There was a question that rose about Aaron's authority as high priest, as the high priest amongst the leaders of Israel. And God said, Tell the, t this is what I'm going to do. Every leader brings their rod, this dead stick. Brings their rod and engrave upon the names, put their names on the rod and lay them at the tabernacle. And he said, in the morning, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. In the morning when they went back, these, these rods from the leaders of Israel they were still dead. They were still dry. But Aaron's rod, the Bible says, it had budded. And almonds had come upon it. In other words, God was confirming. And, and that speaks to us of resurrection, doesn't it? It speaks to us of resurrection. Out of deadness, resurrection came. Thank God, friends, he was dead. But on the third day, God raised him from the dead. He was the first fruits, the Bible says. His resurrection guarantees our resurrection. He was the first fruits of all those who slept. This was the Ark of the Covenant with these three things inside of it. The Ark of the Covenant is one of the most sought after relics of Jewish history. 
still today. There have been countless programs on TV about the Ark of the Covenant. Some say it's in Ethiopia. Heard of one that said it's in Jeremiah's Grotto, Gordon's Calvary, in a guy called Ron Wyatt in 1968, apparently stumbled on this Ark of the Covenant. All speculation. I'm going to kill myself over that, aren't I? So there have been countless um, books written about the Ark of the Covenant. Movies have been made. I think the most important movie, or the most well-known, is, is it Spielberg's Raiders of the Lost Ark? How many have seen that? Oh, I see all you boffins. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Of course, all, all that's fictional. But I want to tell you, friends, there was nothing fictional about the ark. This was the dwelling place where Almighty God chose to meet with man. It was here, just above those two cherubims, that the Shekinah glory could be seen, the glory of God. And there I will meet with you. I will commune with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony. The ark itself was made out of acacia wood, the wood of the desert. It was covered inside and out in gold. It wasn't, it was f about four foot, eight in four foot eight inches, or four foot two inches long and two foot eight inches high. The word ark simply means a box. Another word used for it as a coffin. It was just a box, a gold, a wood box covered in gold inside and out. Because every box needs a lid. And as I've mentioned, this was no ordinary lid. This was called the mercy seat. And God said, there I will meet with you. I will commune with you above the mercy seat. Isn't it amazing that the mercy of God was covering commandments that were broken. God was basically saying no man can keep the commandments. But God's mercy covered them. The mercy seat covered. It covered the rebellion of mankind. The mercy seat was made out of one solid slab of gold. The cherubims were carved out of the same slab of gold is the mercy seat. So it was some piece of gold. The word cherubim simply means spirit being or angels. Cherubim serve in God's presence. They're a form of angel. They serve in the presence of God. They guard the throne of God. God told Moses to make that because he was saying, this will be my throne. And the throne will be guarded as it is in the eternal glory by these cherubim. So in the holy place, there was the lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And beyond the holy place was the most holy of holies. The most sacred spot. And separating the two was a curtain or a veil that separated the two. It was made out of fine linen. It had three colors in this veil. Blue, purple, and scarlet. Again, blue depicting 
the heavens, where he came from. So all speaking of Jesus. The purple, speaking of his kingship. And the scarlet, speaking of the blood that he would shed. Um, embroidered on the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holies, God said, embroider cherubim on this, this, this fine linen. And so there was cherubim on the, the linen curtain. It was called the veil. Simply means, the, a veil simply means a screen or, or a divider. A separator that hides. What was this curtain hiding? Essentially, friends, it was shielding sinful man from a holy God. Within the veil, in the holy of holies, was the visible presence of Almighty God. The picture of the veil was that of a barrier. A barrier between man and God, showing man that the holiness of God couldn't be trifled with. God was holy, and he was separate from sinners. Man could not approach a holy God. The Bible says God's eyes are too pure to look on evil. He cannot tolerate sin. Habakkuk 1 verse 13, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and you cannot look on wickedness. The veil was a barrier, a barrier to make sure that man could not carelessly or irreverently enter into the presence of God. I want to say this morning, friends, the Holy of Holies was an awesome place. Awesome. From the outside, if we were only the priest could go into the holy place, man couldn't go in there, only the priests. But man could come into the place, the, just through the gate to the, the, uh, the altar of sacrifice. And the lever. But they couldn't go into the holy place. The whole, aw, there was an awesomeness about this place. From the outside, you would see a visible cloud abiding above the most holy of holies. You would see it with your eye. You couldn't go inside the tent, but from the outside, there was a cloud that was hovering above the Holy of Holies. The Bible says it was a pillar of cloud by day, and it turned into a pillar of fire by night. So all of Israel and the eyes of all of Israel's enemies could see this cloud. It was visible. But inside the Holy of Holies, there was the glory of God. The Shekinah glory. There the voice of God could be heard. Above the mercy seat between the two cherubims. Once a year in the most solemn day in Israel's calendar. The high priest would go and make his way into the Holy of Holies. That day was the day of atonement. When he would go into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the sins of all the people. No other could enter that holy place apart from the high priest. He was meticulously prepared for this day. His clothes, his body was washed. The high priestly robes were put upon him. And he would go into the holy place burning incense. 
so the smoke of the incense could cover his face from the glory of the presence of God. He was to go into the Holy of Holies taking blood with him. The blood of sacrifice. Once a year he did that to make atonement for the sins of all of Israel. Round the high priest's foot a rope was tied. Just in case the high priest got inside the Holy of Holies and in the awesome presence of God dropped down dead, they would be able to drag him out. It was a solemn day, an awesome day. When the high priest was making his way with blood from the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies, no of the other priests could enter into the tent. Listen to what the Bible says. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. The high priest was the only one allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. Hebrews 9 verse 7, but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself, for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Leviticus 16, 2, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. I will appear in the cloud, the visible presence of God. I will appear. The Bible says no man has seen God at any time. I want to suggest to you, friends, that when he appeared, he appeared as the Christ who would eventually be born into this world. The pre-incarnate Christ who is seen in the Old Testament Time and time again, when God appeared, He appeared in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When Daniel was thrown into the furnace, the king said, I put three men in that furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But behold, I see four men walking. Who did he see? He said, the appearances of the other is like the Son of God. He saw the pre-incarnate Christ before he was born. Friends, before he was born, he was here. We've heard about that last week. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. There has never been a time Jesus has not been. What an awesome place this holy place must have been. I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Whoever entered into this holy place was entering into the very presence of God. So the presence of God remained shielded from the eyes of Israel throughout their history. All they could see, as near as, or as near as they could get, for every priest was up to that altar of incense and to the veil that separated. They couldn't go any further. The presence and the holiness of God was shielded from them throughout their entire history. God is holy. Man is sinful. Sinful man can't approach the awesome presence of Almighty God. In other words, the way to approach the presence of God was not yet known. It's interesting, isn't it? It was a curtain that separated. It wasn't 
a, a, um, a bronze wall. It wasn't a thick piece of steel that separated it. It was a curtain. Speaking of the temporary nature of this thing, God was saying one day that curtain's going to come down. One day man is going to be able to come right into the awesome presence of Almighty God. When the ark was to be carried, we read this morning there was a prescribed way to carry it. Poles had to be left in the four corners of the ark. Gold, made out of acacia wood, covered in gold, but these poles had to be there continually. And when the ark was to be carried, God said nobody must touch it. It must be borne upon the shoulders of the priests. I think it was the Gershomites who had the responsibility for carrying the ark. There was a time when David wanted to bring the ark of the covenant into Jerusalem and place it in the tabernacle there. And as they were bringing the ark of God, it was brought on a cart. God never said bring it on a cart. It was brought on a cart. And as the cart was going along, it must have hit a brick or a stone in the road, and it, it, sh it shook. And two men, two, two brothers, who were the sons of a man called Uzzah, they reached out their hands to steady the ark on the cart. And they dropped down dead. David didn't take the ark that day into Jerusalem. The Bible says he took it to the house of a man called Obededom. And there it, the ark stayed. David learned his lesson. Months later, he brought the ark of God up, but he brought it up in the prescribed way, carried upon the shoulders of the priests. This was an awesome thing. The presence of Almighty God. I want to take you now to a place called Calvary. A place called, in the Hebrew, Golgotha. It was a place of a skull. And there, as we go there, we will see three men being crucified upon crosses. The one who is on the center cross that attracts our attention because this was God's Lamb. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This was God's Lamb. Christ, our Passover, was being sacrificed for us. On the cross, friends, this is exactly what Jesus did. He made atonement taking away the sins of the whole world. Made atonement, just like the high priest made atonement for all of the Israelites. Jesus on the cross, he made atonement on this day, not only for the sins of Israel, but for the sins of all humanity. For my sin and yours, it was laid upon him on the cross. Isaiah said, he... Our transgressions were laid upon him. Our transgressions were laid upon him. There he made atonement for our sins. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Awesome to think that my sin, your sin, was upon him when he died that day. The last words he spoke from the cross, or the last words that could be heard. The Bible says, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Once he'd said that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He's the only man ever to do this. He was the only man who ever lived who chose the exact moment he would die. I know people can choose by 
suicide and things like that, but this was a voluntary, this was his spirit being yielded up, dying. He chose the exact moment, three o'clock in the afternoon. He'd been on that cross for six hours. He was put on it at nine o'clock. At midday, there was darkness over the whole land until three o'clock in the afternoon. When from the cross, there was a piercing cry. The Bible says people heard it. Jesus cried with a loud voice, it is finished. It was exact, at that exact moment at three o'clock in the afternoon when the Passover lambs were being sacrificed in the temple. The exact moment, three o'clock, the priests would be taking the, the first Passover lamb to sacrifice it. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And at the moment of his death, the Bible says there was a great earthquake and the veil, this curtain that is now in the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was a direct replica of the tabernacle in the wilderness. But I want you to understand the veil in the temple was a lot bigger than it was in the tabernacle. The veil in the temple separating the Holy of Holies it was 60 feet high, it was 30 feet wide, and four inches thick. And at that exact moment that Jesus said, it is finished, the Bible says this veil was torn from the top to the bottom. No human hands had touched it, but God tore the veil. Man couldn't have torn it even if he'd got hold of it. It was too thick. But God from above tore that veil in two. And as the veil was torn, the Holy of Holies was exposed. God was saying, my presence is now accessible to all. Shocking as this may have been for the priests who were on duty that day in the temple, they must have been horrified. This massive earthquake and the veil, this mighty 60-foot high curtain that separated the, the holy place from the most holy of holies was split in two from the top to the bottom. They must have been horrified when they saw the veil on the day that Jesus was crucified torn in two. However, for us, friends, it's, in, it's good news. Amen? It's great news. It's great news for all believers everywhere. Jesus' death has atoned for our sins. He's made us right before God. The torn veil in the temple illustrated the body of Jesus that had been broken for us. He opened the way for us to come to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He opened the way for us to come into the presence of God. As Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross. He was indeed proclaiming that God's redemptive plan was now complete. The age of animal sacrifice was over. The ultimate offering had been made. Christ had been sacrificed on our behalf. Isn't it amazing that we now have the right to enter into the holy presence of Almighty God. The same privileges the high priest had once a year are now ours every day of the year. Hallelujah. Every day of the year, we can know His presence. We can meet with God. Not on a yearly basis, but on, a, on an hourly basis, on a daily basis. We can know our God. We can hear the voice of God speaking to us. My sheep hear my voice. You see, friends, if we get into his presence, we'll hear his voice. We'll hear God speaking to us. You say, God never speaks to me. Well, if God never speaks to you, you've never been in his presence. Because his sheep hear his voice. 
And God speaks to us from his presence. We can now enter the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus went before us, has entered on our behalf. Listen to how Paul describes it in Hebrews. Therefore, brothers, since we have a confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full of assurance of faith. Hallelujah. He made a way where there was no way. The Bible says in him we live and move and have our being. We can live our lives daily in the presence of an awesome God. I want to tell you, friends, this is absolutely staggering. Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with us, we don't want to go. Into this new land that's before us, if your presence doesn't go with us, he realized how much he needed the presence of God with him. I want to tell you, folks, we need the presence of God. We need it in our individual lives. We need it in our church. On a Thursday night, we cry out to God for his presence to come amongst us. David said, where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your presence, Lord? Psalm 139, if I, if I ascend to the highest hill, you're there. If I make my bed in the lowest parts of the earth, you are there also. You know my down-sitting, my uprising. There's not a thought in my mind that you, Lord, don't know everything about. Awesome. An omnipotent, omnipotent, somebody say it for me. Omnipotent, <laughs> omnipotent God. All-knowing, all-seeing. Jonah tried to flee from the presence of God. I want to tell you, friends, you'll never escape God's presence. Adam and Eve, they hid, the Bible says, from the presence of the Lord. I want to tell you, when you've got sin in your life, you want to hide from the presence of God because He's holy. When there's unforgiveness in our hearts, when there's sin in our hearts, we want to hide from God's presence just like Adam and Eve did. But it's a wonderful thing to come boldly to the throne of grace, this throne, that we might find His help and to help us in our time of need. Awesome, awesome thing to be in the presence of God. Sinai quaked. Mount Sinai quaked at the presence of God. The Bible says a fire goes before Him and burns up all His enemies. The hills melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Nations tremble, Isaiah says, in the presence of the Lord. This awesome God. No wonder Israel's enemies were terrified. Because God was with them. Thank God, friends, He's with us. He's not only with us, He's in us. Our bodies have become temples, a dwelling place of Almighty God. To live our lives in God's presence is a great place to be. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. What a privilege is ours this morning to come boldly into the presence of God. We sing that hymn, don't we? Bold I approach the eternal throne. We can come boldly now because Jesus has made a way. His blood has atoned for our sins and we can come boldly into the very presence of God. Draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. We can draw near to God. No more veil. God bids me enter by a new and living way. Friends, there's no more veil. 
we can come into the very presence of God. The Bible says if we draw near to God, He will draw near to us. Paul said that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection. I pray that that is the cry of all of our hearts this morning, that we might know Him. That we might know Him and His power. You see, God's presence, when we get the presence of God, we'll get the power of God. Some people want the power of God without the presence of God. I want to tell you, friends, the presence of God, when we, get, when, we get, when we get Him, then when we get to know Him, the power of God comes with it. The power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. Let us fulfill our duty as priests before God. The Bible says we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are a kingdom of priests unto our God. Let's fulfill our duties as we stand before, God, stand before God on behalf of men, interceding for them on behalf of, on God's behalf, praying that people will be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth. Who are we standing for this morning? Who are we standing and appealing to the Almighty for that they might be saved? Let's declare the good news to everybody that we meet. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. He's gone through the curtain. Let's daily seek His presence. I know one thing, that when we seek His presence, we are changed. Remember when Moses went into the presence of God. He came out, and the Bible says his face shone. And the children of Israel couldn't look at him because he'd been in the presence of God. I want to tell you, friends, when you're in the presence of God, it will change your life. It brings change to our lives. David said, cast me not away from your presence. Cast me not away from your presence. He, he, he realized how much the presence of God meant to him. Cast me not away. In Acts we read, he will bring times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. When we get the presence of God, there will be times of refreshing. Amen? Amen. Sent from the presence of God. I pray this morning that God will give us a hunger for Him. If we hunger and thirst after Him, we'll be filled. Friends, it's not all the trappings. It's Him. It's Him. You come to a point in your life when you realize there's not anything else but Him. On that last day that we've sang about this morning, let me tell you, friends, on that last day, there's only one thing that will matter. Him. Him. The eternal one who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm looking this morning at a bunch of priests unto God. I'm looking this morning at men and women who are God's chosen people, who have the privilege of walking in the presence of God, living their lives in the awesome presence of the Almighty. May God help us to know Him more. If you don't know Him this morning, let me tell you, friends, when He died on that cross, He died for you, and He loves you. He's willing to give, wipe the slate clean and give you a brand new life. Hallelujah. A life of purpose. A life of fulfillment. Not a bed of roses. I'm not going to say if you give your life to Jesus, you won't have any troubles. Man's born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. But I want to tell you when the storms come, if you are living your life on the foundation of his word, you'll stand the test. You won't be shaken. Let's pray. We praise your name, Lord. We worship you. We thank you this morning, Lord, that we can approach the eternal throne. We can draw near to God with a full heart of assurance and faith. Thank you this morning, Lord, that you made a way where sinful man can come into your awesome presence and not be consumed, but might know mercy and grace poured out upon us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Christian friend this morning, desire his presence. Desire him more than your necessary food. In him we live and move and have our being. Friend, this morning, if you don't know him, he's only a prayer away. And this morning you can get to know him. This Jesus who is alive. He can come and make his home in you right now. Is there anyone here this morning who for the first time would say, Lord Jesus, I need you as my Savior. I'm sorry for my sin. I repent. I realize my sin took you to the cross. My sin was laid upon you on the cross. This morning I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to forgive me. If there's anyone this morning, will you just raise your hand? I'll see it and I'll ask you to put it down. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life this morning, is there anyone here? To receive him is the greatest thing. I will come and make my home with him. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's all stand.